by Ryan George Kittleman. The bourbon vertigo came first. Rufus's brain felt like a thick slurry slowly churning in a cement mixer. His stomach's only remedy for the coming flood was an influx of acid and bile. His tongue longed for water, though his choked and filmy throat was already impossibly tight. His knees weakened, his legs wobbled, his barrel teetered. He tried pivoting his feet and waving his arms, but his impaired coordination only made a fall from barrel mount more eminent. The only thing keeping him upright was the rope around his neck. The rope! Oh, God, what have I done, he thought. The barrel spun off axis, oscillating elliptically. Rufus realized he should have done more research on this whole hanging business. He could have blown his brains out, for instance, or plunged off a cliff. Also, he was fairly new to knot tying, a hobbyist at best. What made him so sure that at this, at last, he would finally be a success? Why hadn't he considered that a poorly tied noose can cause one to die slowly of strangulation? Worse yet, didn't he know it could snap the vertebrae only partially, leaving him to dangle there like a jackass, humiliated, until someone decided to cut him down with a pair of garden shears? The barrel tipped onto its side and rolled into a pile of bodies. Rufus had experienced this feeling once before, on a boardwalk ride during one of his family's summer pilgrimages to Maine. He felt it in the pit of his stomach. It was the law of gravity passing sentence. A failure in life and in death, Rufus thought. His arms flailed as he fell, a little slack the only thing keeping Rufus Wiggin, hair, Adam's apple, ascot, blazer and all, from the great unknown. The slack vanished in an instant, tightening against its key. Here comes the death knell. Rufus's head cocked to the side, striking its final pose. But before the rope could inflict the mortal blow, the knot snapped, sending Rufus crashing onto the floor. Dumbfounded, Rufus inspected the frayed end of his rope, a piece of it still tethered to the rafter. I'm saved, he thought. By my own incompetence, saved. Rufus looked around for approbation, only to find that his was still only a sideshow act. The epic battle of attrition continued to be waged all around him. The bartender fired a round into the ceiling. Chunks of moldy debris and asbestos rained onto the bar. The shot didn't startle Rufus. With the noose hanging freely from his neck, he sat contentedly on the floor, clinging to the barrel like a marooned sailor. He had never been happier to be alive. In all the commotion, including but not limited to his own deliberate, regrettable, accidental near-suicide, Rufus had failed to notice a trio had begun setting up on a small riser at the opposite end of the bar. How delightful, Rufus thought, eating a peanut off the floor. He took off his socks and shoes and made himself at home. The guitarist was short and lean, his tightly coiled locks flattened down by a corduroy newsboy. His eyes were dark and remote as if forever hitched to a star that no one could see but him. Worldly Rufus had pegged him as the romantic revolutionary type, a self-styled poet with reams of verse scribbled in battered journals. Undoubtedly, he was a vain egotist to boot. The drummer was harder to read. Shielded by a veritable barbican of kick drums, a battlement of toms and a canopy of ride, crash and splash cymbals, he was within his fortress hidden in plain sight. Finally, there was the basis. Rufus was instantly enamored, hopelessly smitten, nauseatingly drunk with love. She was all arms and legs and a shape nearly identical to the base slung low around her neck, a wide bottom and voluptuous curves, and a lean stalk. Rufus loved to watch a girl perform on stage. It could transform even the mousiest chain into a goddess. Listen up, pricks. The guitarist growled into the mic, letting out a blast of feedback. We're the going out of business sale. The drummer started in with a thunderous backbeat at the speed of a heart about to expire from a cocaine overdose. The bassist came in next, plucking out a McCartney-esque run, walking the sidewalk scale under a cloud of distortion. The floor rumbled under Rufus's behind, causing all the broken teeth on the floor to dance and shake, like players in an old magnetic football game. Rufus plucked a rather lively incisor from the scrum and stuck it in his pocket for luck. There was something pleasantly discordant about this music, something compellingly complex about the arrangements. 
The time signatures were odd, but changed with sharp precision. Every nook and cranny of space was filled with some morsel of sonic stuffing. A small, quiet note here. A booming bass octave there. Rufus sat prostrate, wrapping himself in the warm, sonorous blanket that enveloped the room. Closing his eyes, he found it hard to believe that these three young souls were capable of producing such a glorious cacophony. He yielded to rolling waves of abrasive yet otherworldly, claustrophobic yet expansive, tuneful yet atonal sounds. At last, there seemed to be no contradictions. The attendance for the show had now grown to an unlikely crowd of over two dozen, and all were equally enthralled to this melodious rapture. To call them fans wouldn't do their devotion justice. They were disciples. How fashionable this crowd is, Rufus thought. How careless of the typical de rigueur, how free. Rufus was disappointed in himself. How had these chic bohemians escaped his notice? He was supposed to be hip to these things. He looked with envy at the brooding and contemplative guys and frisky and ebullient girls. What I would do for just a peek inside their world, Rufus thought. Little did he know what was about to transpire. The show ended with a typical big rock finale. The drummer wailed on every cymbal in sight, the guitarist thrashed the same chord repeatedly, and the bassist kicked on a looping pedal, put down her instrument, and sipped her beer. Her final notes marched on with the band. One of the disciples handed her a candy apple red gas can, the kind with a nozzle like a bendy straw. She passed it to the guitarist. We're the going out of business ale, he reminded the crowd. He lifted the container above his head. Good night. He turned the can upside down, and when he was properly soaked, he passed the can back to the bassist, who playfully sprayed the drummer. The bassist then turned the spray on herself. By sense of touch alone, the guitarist found a matchbook and violently ripped one out. The implication began to dawn on Rufus. Having survived his own encounter with death less than an hour before, he believed he was currently in possession of a special sensitivity about these matters. He couldn't sit idly by while these gifted angels sent themselves back to heaven. Rufus watched the disciples passively abet the band's luckless scheme. He noticed that those smirking little twits weren't dousing their own bodies in gasoline. Of course not. What self-respecting Philistine would soil their precious plaid button-up in an act of political defiance? No, Rufus said. No, rising from the floor. For what purpose had he been saved that night? What grand luck, he reflected fondly, to be saved by one's own incompetence. Perhaps he was destined to save these musicians in return. After all, two well-intentioned yet embarrassingly conducted suicide attempts on the same night, at the same bar, could be no coincidence. What were the odds? If the stage was their barrel, then Rufus decided that he must be their shoddy knot. Don't do it, Rufus yelled, sprinting towards them. Like a true Schuyler alum, he threw his shoulders back and raised his chin high. Don't do it, he repeated, muscling his way through the disciples. He was close enough to inhale the gasoline's pungent odor. The scent of that viscous serum of dug-up and refined fossils filled his nostrils. The sensation was both intoxicating and revolting. Don't do it, he shouted once more. Surely the band must have been startled by the sight of a crazed, barefoot, and drunken man with a noose around his neck running towards them. The sight only hastened the guitar's resolve to strike a match. As his eyes cleared and the approaching lunatic came into focus, his hand nervously rubbed one stick after another along the matchbook's red phosphorus stripe. With only one remaining, the potassium chloride finally ignited, flaring up into a bright orange cone. Ghostly wisps of sulfur swirled around it. His neckerchief caught fire instantly, burned upward and began closing in on his throat like a long wick blazing its way back to a pile of dynamite. In this instance, the guitarist's face was the dynamite. It may have been the sudden, unplanned running, or the noxious fumes, or the gallon of bourbon in his belly, but just then Rufus's nausea returned. He began to think that maybe he was not their savior after all. He felt like a failure once more. Rufus realized how silly he must look running across the bar, but before he could stop and turn to leave, the deus ex machina came thundering out. <laughs> 
A concentrated torrent of barf spewed from Rufus's mouth and hit the guitarist square in the chest. The flames were quelled in one disgusting swoop. Yet Rufus's internal fire extinguisher was not yet done saving the day. He added several more coats, for safety's sake, he told himself, already taking credit for the rescue. The guitarist did nothing but stand there in disbelief. How punk rock, Rufus heard the bassist say. Her devilish smile was the last thing that night he would remember. <laughs> 